this clip, I'm going to investigate a question we've all asked ourselves. How much chance does a knight have of slaying a dragon? More specifically, how probable is this in the computer game Age of Wonders? Ok, maybe you haven't all wondered about this, and maybe you are not as keen on getting the answer to this particular question as I am. What this clip is really about is inference on the free binomial distribution. As you hopefully remember from the previous three clips, the setup for that model is that you got two outcomes, success and failure. Each trial is independent from the last and has a fixed probability p for success. Each trial is independent from the last and has a fixed probability p for success. Hence it describes repeatable independent trials with only two outcomes. What I mean by free is that the value of p is not known prior to the data. It's a free parameter. I wanted an example where I could collect the data myself. Ideally I wished for an example where you watching the clip could also be able to do so, but I kind of compromised on that wish. Getting independent trials isn't something you can get everywhere, though hopefully you can see how to do similar experiments from this clip. Dice, coins, cards and so forth typically have those qualities, but I didn't want only such applications. Those aren't terribly exciting, I think. I'm planning to use some statistics from YouTube later on, so I'm using the opportunity to find out about something I care about. Back to the theory. For a given theoretical success rate, P, you can calculate the probability for so and so many successes and failures in N trials. But normally the world won't just hand you the value for the parameter P. And with different values for p, you'll get different probabilities for each possible outcome. But that's the key here. Since an outcome has a different probability for different values of p, this formula tells us that we can get wiser about the value of p with some data. Clip 16 showed an example of this, but only with two different possibilities for the value of p. The previous clip showed that the precision of the outcome increases with increasing data size, so we can get as much info as we like about p. Note that p in itself it denotes a probability. We assume that there is a model where we can't get any wiser about future events, and we call the probability of success under that model p. Each future outcome is uncertain, and p tells us how uncertain it is. When we want to find out what p is, we start out by being uncertain about an uncertainty, and so we put a probability distribution on the probability. Since p denotes a probability, the value of it can be any real number between 0 and 1. And that's a big space to explore. There are ways to deal with probabilities of uncertain real valid numbers, but this is something I want to avoid at least for a little while longer. Since the precision of binomial outcomes is finite for finite numbers, we won't make any big mistakes by instead dividing up the possible values of p in a finite set of possibilities, if this discretization is just fine enough. I'm going to look at only 101 different possibilities for the value of p, namely 0, 1%, 2%, 3% and so forth up to 100%. In order to see the effect of the data optimally, I'll use an ignorance prior on p. Each of the 101 possible values of p is assigned the probability 1 divided by 101, see clip 7. Note that before the data, there is no most probable model. That doesn't mean that we don't have a probability for success in a single trial. We can use rule 6 from clip 2b and get that the probability of success is the probability of success given that p equal to 0 times the probability for p equal to 0 plus the probability of success given p equal to 1% times the probability for p equal to 1% and so forth up to p equal to 100%. But this is precisely the same as the expectancy of p under the prior probability distribution. We can get an expectancy by weighting each possibility with its probability and sum it up. So 
the probability of success is the expectancy of p. If we had data, we would get the same kind of result. The probability of success given the data is the expectancy of p given the data. With the prior distribution assigned, it is now possible to start the fun part of collecting the data. So let's line up a hundred dragons and a hundred knights on the field of glory and start the experiment. The first dragon flies up to the first knight, delivers its three fire breaths, then the dragon delivers the final attack where the knight can answer, but he is too damaged. That did not go too well for the knights, and neither does this. Looks like the knights are in for a rough haul. Now I've done 10 battles and let's pause here. The dragons have won every time. A naive frequentist would say that we estimate p to be 0, which means that the knights can't win. I'll get back to this later. Let's skip ahead to the final grizzly results. At the end of the battle there remains 91 well-fed dragons and 9 badly burnt but very relieved knights. Let's plug that into base formula. There's a flat prior probability for p and a data probability given p which is the binomial distribution. This will deliver the posterior probability for each value of p which is shown in this graph. Which shows the same kind of bell shaped curve we've seen previously by the way. The value of p with the highest posterior probability is 9%, the absurd rate. In frequentist statistics, using the absurd rate as the estimate for the real thing is normal. On the other hand, the posterior probability for success, the expectancy of p, turned out to be 9.8%, which is a little higher than the absurd rate. The reason is that we started with an ignorance prior which was balanced around p equal to 50%. The posterior result is a compromise between prior and data, though with an ignorance prior, the emphasis is on the data. Let's go back to the situation 10 trials into the run. No knights had won, so the frequentist estimate was p equal to 0. The posterior result at the time looked like this. p equal to 0 was the most probable single binomial model. But still, the models with low but finite p delivered powerful contributions. We've got evidence of p equal to zero, but it's not very convincing yet. The expectancy of p is 7.9%, so with a Bayesian approach, we wouldn't have given up on the knights yet. Our temporary conclusion would be that the knights' chances are low but probably finite. So the Bayesian estimated probability and the absurd rate differs in a very meaningful manner in this case. We've got that the estimated probability for success was 0.098 after the data. In the posterior probability distribution of p, we've got something far better than just that though. We've also got an idea about how uncertain we are about the value of p. One way to do this is to report the standard deviation as in the previous clip, which turned out to be 0.029. Or we can look at where at least 90% of the posterior probability is. Such an inference on the possible parameter values is called a credibility interval. With a little inspection of the distribution, I found that p ranging from 0.05 to 0.14 is where such a bulk of the posterior probability is found. So for the experiment we can be fairly sure that the knight's chances of winning isn't lower than 5% and isn't higher than 14%. The difference between estimating and doing a full Bayesian inference can also be seen when predicting. If you just took the estimate for granted and wanted to predict the outcome for the next 50 battles, you'd get this graph, the binomial distribution for p equal to 0.09. Compare that to the probability for the outcomes given only the data, where we use rule 6 to decompose the predictions into the various possible values for p. The distribution is now wider. If we just took the estimate for granted, we would have an exaggerated confidence in getting something between 3 and 6, 
compared to when we take the uncertainty of p into account. I guess the results are bad news for the knights, but such are the breaks. No guts, no glory.